it work? It worked! <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dragon Plus live stream. I am here with uh, Jeremy Crawford. Uh, we are giggling because we are, I feel like it's, it's a car operating by itself. Yes, those, yeah, uh, we don't. We don't have Pelham or anyone else at the controls. <laughs> <laughs> we are running this ourselves. Yes, Sean well, Mayofsky got us up and running, and now he's left the room. Yes. So as far as I know, we're streaming. I can see people streaming on the, on the uh, yes. <laughs> Good to see you, everyone. Yes, we are on the wrong sides of the desk. So the chat has already. That's, uh, that's what I said when I know. came in uh, to the studio. I said, Bart, you're on my side of the table. It's true. Yes, it's, it's a it's a uh, an experiment all around. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, welcome back, everyone. We have been off for a number of weeks. I've been traveling. I know you've been traveling as well uh, and attending uh, PAX East. For a bit of that time, correct? That was. Uh, that feels like it was months ago. I know. It's we haven't we haven't been streaming since at least PAX East and the uh, the live game that you were running. Yeah. With uh, uh, you managed to, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, hopefully not spoilers, but uh, Viari uh, came out of that all right, and uh, Jim got uh, Black Pillow, but uh, he still managed to to do okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, a, there was even a character who got juiced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll have to watch the episode to see uh, what the context of that is. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, how, how, was, uh, how was PAX East? I know you were, you were kind of uh, traveling around quite a bit uh, around those times. Uh, That's right, because I, I headed to California yes. after that. Uh, PAX East was great. Mm -hmm. uh, I love DMing uh, for those guys. Uh, such a fun group, uh, such a wacky campaign. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been watching. Uh, we have more craziness in store later this year. Uh, it was also my shortest time ever at a convention because mm. I was at PAX East just for the day of the game yes. and then flew off uh, <laughs> to be with my family uh, in California. So if I didn't see any of you while you were there and you were hoping to see me, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to uh, say hi. Uh, normally, I like to walk around uh, the Adventurers League area in a convention, and if time allows, even DM in it. Uh, but I was just zooming through PAX East uh, to DMing, and then off I went. And that's no small travel to Boston, to California, uh, Seattle. Yeah. That's uh, not easy flights. It, it was a lot, <laughs> but it was worth it. It was it was worth it. Uh, for that uh, crazy session of D&D. &D. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so we do have a bit of catching up to do. It's been, I want to say, three weeks uh, since we've been live streaming. I was off myself. I was traveling over to the UK and then uh, managed to make it over to TwitchCon EU in Berlin, a city I've never been to uh, before, but I enjoyed immensely. I uh, saw the, uh, the, the remains of the wall and uh, all of the, the bit of history there. But, and, of course, TwitchCon. And, uh, Mark Humes was running a D&D Live game uh, at the convention as well. So mm, it, nice. was, uh, it was great to see. It was, uh, it, it, it was an interesting live game. He was on a ship. It was sort of a bit of Ghost of Saltmarsh themed. And uh, at some point, the audience took it upon themselves to voice their opinions as the crew. So he would just throw <laughs> it out to them as far as, what should we do? I was, Yay or nay? And, excellent, excellent. That worked out pretty well. Uh, so thank you uh, again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, what we wanted to do this week is, again, catch up. We had some news and announcements we wanted to cover as well. Uh, we have a few more of your questions regarding the Artificer, of course, the latest unearthed arcana that went live at the end of February at this point. Uh, and if you do have other questions about the Artificer, I suppose, in, uh, regarding anything Dungeons & Dragons related, uh, please do put it in chat and uh, this week, it's more likely than not that we'll actually get a chance to uh, to grab some of your your uh, chat questions. So. Yeah, yeah. Please, please get those uh, either rules questions or just general D and D questions ready for us. Uh, and yes, please do <coughs> preface it with question. And uh, thank you to our moderators for uh, compiling those and sending them our way. Uh, so questions, any, uh, any questions for the Avengers uh, predictions coming out on, uh, on Friday? 
Oh my gosh, is that this <laughs> week? Yes. So yes, I have, because I've been trying studiously to avoid spoilers, but now it's it's almost time to come up with theories. How is it that how is how is it this week already? I know. So I've I have been with all my travel, and yeah. then since getting back, I have been in my writing rabbit hole uh -huh. that I completely lost track <laughs> of where we were, and was like, oh, Avengers <laughs> this week. Yes. So yeah, Avengers Endgame is going to open up. It'll wrap up some of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, phase, whatever we're in now, which is kind of exciting. So yeah, you, you, the, the good good guys will save the day. And uh... I, I'm assuming so. <laughs> uh, I I think uh, Doctor Strange in the previous film. <laughs> Probably watched this new movie in advance because <laughs> there was that there was that moment where Doctor Strange had the prophetic experience, yes. and you know he he said he saw all of these different possibilities that that the good guys fail in all of them except there was one pathway to victory. Yes, and so again I imagine really just Doctor Strange was watching the new movie, uh, and <laughs> conversing with the Russo brothers. <laughs> that's right. Like, that's right. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for that myself, uh, and I'm, I've uh, three weeks of travel. I've, uh, I've I'm behind in my project runway um, pool, so I have to put in my my uh, guesses, guesses for that, and my other pool is the Game of Thrones uh, oh, okay. Deadpool. <clears throat> I'm also behind and putting in my guesses there. So well, I'm a lot of catching up to do. Thus far, the new season of Game of Thrones, and I won't spoil anything. Uh, for anyone who hasn't caught up yet, but it's been very light on deaths. Okay, is it? All right. Yeah, yeah. I haven't caught up on it yet. Okay, yeah. I have to uh. wait for it to drop on Amazon. So I, uh, it's I, a weird pool to be in because I have to guess in advance. At, at home, we've been referring to the first two episodes as many meetings, part one and part two. Because uh, <laughs> the, the first two episodes are really just so-and-so meet so-and-so. <laughs> and then they go meet another so-and-so. And then they go meet another so-and-so. Uh, but the most recent episode, the mm -hmm. second one, had some uh, particularly touching moments. Mm. I won't say I won't say what happens though, yeah. so that you can experience them uh, yourself. Uh, it's, I, I'm trying to pull this back towards D and D. I promise, but it's, I find it interesting in terms of a storytelling uh, method, in terms of a campaign. Uh, trying to find a satisfying way to tie up storylines. Mm. Okay, they certainly have an, mm. an obvious challenge, and I, I'm just supposing. In Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, uh, there's an equal challenge. Uh, have you had um, experience or challenges or solutions to wrapping up story storylines in your, your personal campaigns? Yeah, uh, for sure. Because I've run a number of campaigns that have lasted many years, and one of the things I've found is a DM has to be careful if a campaign is going on for a long time not to get too attached to the ending they imagined mm. way back when they finished the, I mean, when they started the campaign. Mm -hmm. Because many of us uh, who create these epic multi-year campaigns imagine some thrilling finale, but usually, as soon as the campaign meets the players, yes. things start <laughs> shooting off in all sorts of other directions. <laughs> and so my advice to everyone else, which is advice I have to remind myself of, is that you got to let the players mm. steer where it goes in the end. Mm. You can still bring in some of those beloved elements that you've wanted to see at the climax of your grand story. Yes. But you always have to remind yourself, to the very end, it's the player's story too, and make sure they feel like they had a hand in creating that climax to the campaign. Mm. This is, this is uh, not just a theoretical thing for me right now, because my home campaign uh, and I'll be having a session of it this coming Saturday, uh, is actually nearing its end. Mm. And so I'm having to face this issue as we speak <laughs> of resisting the urge to force a particular ending. I've got to let my players steer it. And thus far I have, because they are already doing things in this final chapter of the campaign that mm. I did not expect. And I've really enjoyed kind of letting go and just letting them run with it. Uh, and there's a really good chance they're gonna completely destroy themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a part of me that would wanna protect them from that, but that can actually make for a, a 
stunning, memorable end to a campaign. Sure, yes. Uh, I, you remember the ones as much as the 20s, you know, when you roll the dice. And yeah, yeah. Not so much the 11s, you know. It, uh, and it kind of, again, it's, it's, it makes Dungeons & Dragons such a, a unique storytelling proposition where it's collaborative mm -hmm. as opposed to something that is receptive as an audience like the Avengers where you don't really have a hand in what story is going to be told. Right. Uh, you know, we, in, in many cases we wish we did. We write our own fiction about it. We craft our own theories about it. Uh, great theories in, in some cases, but yeah, actually steering the story directly, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to do that uh, around, around the table. So. But again, as DM, you have to make sure when your hand is on the steering wheel that it's light <laughs> um, because the, the players need to feel like they steered it too. <laughs> and again, we have no hand on our steering wheel in the studio today, Paul. <laughs> Helen is we're, out. We're careening toward the cliff, <laughs> Bart, <laughs> save us. Thank God for moderators <laughs> in the chat as far as the, on the technical <laughs> side of thing. Uh, we, we just have the camera up and running, so hopefully... Uh, hopefully it will go uh, according to plan. The sound yeah. was was going in and out last night for dice camera. Action. Oh, okay. Oh no! Please hold. I the Millennium Falcon all over here. So pl please hold it together. Yeah. Just <laughs> can we just punch it? Yeah. Like Han Solo does. <laughs> uh, so uh, we again we've got some news and announcements uh, about many things and uh, questions. Let's go to a couple of questions uh, since you've taken the time to submit your questions. I'll go to a few that we collected from the chat from last time. Uh, we'll cover a bit more of the Artificer, and then I know I see questions coming in this uh, live stream as well. Uh, but let's, let's jump a bit back towards uh, the Artificer. Uh, and uh, the I categorized here, I've got uh, some on the turrets, some on the homunculi. Uh, Wazid asks about the deterrence. Will they give flanking bonuses if you use? Them? So the optional flanking rule in the Dungeon Master's Guide uh, assumes that you are uh, working with other creatures uh, mm -hmm. to flank somebody else, and the turrets don't mm -hmm. qualify as creatures. So technically, uh, they're not going to help you uh, flank. Um, because the turret is, uh, given its description, a magical object, not a creature. Now, a DM could decide uh, that the turrets uh, will help you flank, um, but that, isn't, that is not the intent of the design. Uh, one on the homunculus now, and then I'm, I'm going to jump to one uh, live afterwards. Uh, John Omatho, uh, which is also a mouthful, asks, the alchemical homunculus is a bit of a mouthful. Is that name finalized, or might something more concise be considered? I happen to enjoy the alchemical homunculus, because I think it, it It's fun to say. Yes. Uh, so uh, we are open to changing many things in the class uh, based on the feedback that we will get from you all when we release the survey for the class pretty soon. Okay. Um, we, I think we mentioned last time that we're holding off on releasing the survey until we release a few more options mm. for the class because we want to get your feedback on all of the material together mm -hmm. uh, rather than asking you to give us feedback on the artificer in sort of two chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, we want just one big survey then we'll make some revisions and then you're likely to see uh, another version. Mm. Uh, uh, but if, if enough people say, oh boy, alchemical homunculus, I, <laughs> I, I cannot pronounce it to save my life, uh, then we'll consider uh, a, a, different, a different word. Um, one of the reasons why homunculus is in the name at all is because it was a part of the original Artificer in third edition. Mm. Uh, and so that is a, a beloved part uh, of the class. Uh, not to mention uh, a part of alchemist history I, I in our say, world, yes. uh, and so that is that is a big. Re those are two big reasons why uh, those uh, tangled words uh, appear in the class. <laughs> uh, let me uh, let me jump to uh, to one we've got coming in here. Uh, speaking about campaigns and and running the campaigns. Um, uh, Banu UK asks, do you prefer games with the large meta plots that are more common nowadays or more sandbox campaigns? I enjoy both. Mm. Uh, and 
when I DM a campaign, I always have a, a meta plot, mm -hmm. but the, the strength of that meta plot changes from campaign to campaign. Sometimes I have players who really love that feeling of this epic story that is arcing over everything that goes on in the campaign. Other players kind of like to wander around and do their own thing more. Yeah. And so in a campaign like that, I, I tend to lessen the weight of the meta plot, but I still have one. And mm. one of the reasons why I do, and, and why I recommend that even a sandbox campaign at least have a little bit of a meta plot, mm -hmm. is a meta plot allows you to, at the end, give a sense of, of at least light cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. Meta plot can also be a good tool for the DM to introduce some recurring element especially in a sandbox campaign where things might slow down. Because sometimes in a sandbox campaign which heavily relies on players driving the action, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally the DM is gonna want to sort of jolt some life back into the campaign. Sure, mm -hmm. you could do it without a meta plot, but the beauty of having a meta plot is then whenever you do that jolt and it's some recurring element, whether it's a villain group or NPCs who keep showing up, mm -hmm that sense of recognition in the players uh, is really powerful because then they feel like we really are in a world uh, because there are certain things that show back up. And it's also a way for you to show consequence uh, because if, let's say there's an NPC early in the campaign that the, the player characters mess with and then maybe several levels later that NPC reappears and is now pissed off and out <laughs> to get them, <laughs> the, the players get to see, oh, our choices made a difference. Right, and as a dungeon master, your, your, your lifting is a little less because you're not introducing a, a new NPC from whole cloth every time. They've got a yes. connection there. And that, that is the other reason I love having at least a light meta plot mm -hmm. is it actually makes your prep easier in mm -hmm. some ways because it means you have, it's like having this this little toolbox that you can keep going back to. Mm -hmm. If Let's say you, you have a, a session coming up and you like, oh, I'm not sure what to have happen in my session. If necessary, you can always lean back on your meta plot. Uh, of some element from it is gonna show up. Uh, going back to story writing and media, it, it reminds me of, of you know, TV writing with X-Files where you've got mm -hmm. your monster of the week plot mm -hmm. sometimes. You have a light meta plot. Sometimes it gets a little heavier in later seasons. But you also have that to kind of help uh, drive a little bit of the character motivation for, for, uh, for viewers as well. So. Yeah, and uh, in, in the original X-Files series, I liked that back and forth between mm -hmm. uh, the standalone episodes yeah. and the meta plot episodes. Yeah, and yeah, and you can do light touches between mm -hmm. the two. You can kind of go heavy in one or the other. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's answer some more of your questions. Uh, Artificer Spells, and we'll jump uh, to some of the live questions after this. Ha Eldkron asks, uh, have you considered doing the spell storing feature as a phased in ability so that it doesn't just appear later in the class, but rather grows in power as you level? Uh, I think there might be a better way to do that feature. Uh, <laughs> so yes, we've definitely considered that and that's feedback we've already seen on Reddit and Twitter and there is a good chance in a future version of the class, uh, the spell storing ability would show up sooner. Okay. Uh, I, 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 this one I know is going to be a bit of a, uh, a sensitive one, but because we had mentioned additional parts of the Artificer, are we looking at weeks or more than a month before we see the next Artificer parts? Or perhaps this is a good opportunity to maybe reiterate uh, for Unearthed Arcana, the timeline will be yeah. as things are ready. Yeah, for Unearthed Arcana, uh, we no longer have a... Uh, regular release schedule for it. We're, we're going to release things uh, when they are ready for you all to look at them and for you to give us feedback on them. Uh, and that gives us the flexibility to sometimes uh, have bigger gaps of time uh, between releases, but it also opens up for us maybe having another period like we did a few years mm. ago where we're releasing on Earth Arcana multiple times a month. Uh, so it, so basically, the lack of a regular schedule means it can go in both directions. Uh, it can mean maybe sometimes there'll be a month or two where we don't release anything, and then 
there might be a month or two where we release a bunch of things. Uh, it's going to be driven much more in the future by what it is we're designing, what we want feedback on. Um, in the past, uh, partly just to sort of keep the regular rhythm going up, we would occasionally release something that was uh, purely an experiment that had no connection to mm -hmm. any future product. And as fun as those things were for us to do, they were actually taking time away from our work on our books. Right. And, <laughs> and especially now, uh, as of last year when we released uh, four books, uh, we, we need to keep our focus on, <laughs> on making our books as great as they can be for everybody. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we're making Unearthed Arcana uh, have an irregular schedule, uh, but with the hope that it will do even more good for all of us as D&D fans uh, by getting material out there for you that has a good chance of showing up in a product at some point uh, and then m giving room for your feedback uh, to help us shape that material so it's as strong as it can be. Uh, all right, so there you go. We'll, we'll look for that when, it's, uh, when it is. So answer hazy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I saw one come in. I saw a couple come in here. Uh, I think it was the Jolly Jolly Green Knight. Is that uh, a mic? Jolly Green Knight, yes. Uh, we're going back and forth on some of the questions. Uh, going back even further and answering some of your even older questions. Uh, we, we do have sort of a running tally here, but let me do make this suggestion if there is uh, an old question, perhaps off topic, but that had been uh, burning on your mind. Resubmit it now, and then as, as we kind of catch up through the most recent chat logs, we'll be able to, to recapture uh, some of your questions as well. Uh, there's another question that I saw come in regarding the Stranger Things uh, starter set. Uh, did want to just mention quickly, I, 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 I was in Barnes & Noble yesterday, and I saw it on shelves. Uh -huh. So I know it is out yes. in, in the world yep, now. It's out in the world. Yes. Uh, the, the only reason I wanted to bring that up in particular is also to mention that the next issue of Dragon Plus uh, will be out uh, uh, <laughs> ideally uh, before the end of this week. We did a, a bit of a Stranger Things uh, starter set look. We talked to uh, Stan and Ben Petrosor, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, the, the artist uh, who is doing uh, a lot of the, the black and white drawings mm -hmm. for the uh, starter set. So uh, if you have uh, some, some interest in the Stranger Things starter set, uh, look for the interview in the next issue of Dragon Plus. It's free, iOS, Android at dragonmag.com. Uh, hopefully we'll have that up. We're, <laughs> we're, I'm, I'm hedging because I'm just waiting on final approval of that one particular article, and then we can put the whole issue. Oh, okay, great. So, great, great. Uh, oddly enough, when Hasbro and Netflix are involved, the approval process takes a bit longer than I would have otherwise anticipated. So. Uh, regarding the Stranger Things starter set, one question I've seen mm -hmm. online is whether this starter set replaces the other D&D starter set? Mm. And the answer to that question is no. Uh, the Stranger Things starter set is just another option for how you can dive into D&D, uh, but the, the starter set that has uh, the Lost Mine of Fandelver in it uh, is still out there, uh, and uh, we expect it to be around for quite a while. Uh, when I was traveling around in, in, uh, in London and, and Berlin, uh, when I would go to the bookstores just to kind of say, hey, what's the, the lay of the land? The, the starter set, the, the, the um, Lost Minds of Fandelver starter set, right there in front of the counter, uh, still still there. Yeah. Uh, am I correct in my belief that you helped shape some of the, the rule structuring and formatting for the Stranger Things uh, starter set, just getting them nice and concise and, and all of that? Yeah, well, largely because uh, I was the one who uh, put together the rule book in the original starter set. Mm -hmm. And so then when uh, they took uh, the rule book I did for that starter set and repurposed it for uh, 
the Stranger Things starter set, yes. I then basically consulted a bit on uh, how to make everything work because there's an additional class uh, in the Stranger Things starter set. So we definitely had to do some squeezing and moving <laughs> some things around uh, to, to get all to get all that material in there. But it's it's fun. It's it's it's, it's a fun uh, product. Actually, I would say three different class, three different spellcasting classes, oh. uh, I believe, because I think that set has a bard in it. A ranger in it and a paladin in it. Yes, the paladin. If, I, I remember. if I'm remembering yes. correctly, yeah. And uh, some cool monsters with the demigorgon and mm -hmm. the, uh, the Thessal Hydra. Is in not the not to be confused with Demogorgon. Right. This is this is <laughs> a a demigorgon, not the demigorgon. Yeah. <laughs> well, the the way the way I the way I differentiate is with Demogorgon. That's its name. Right. The the demon lord. Yeah. Whereas that other creature is a demogorgon or mm. or the demogorgon. I'm trying to think of like a real world equivalency where it's like that's oh, Christopher as opposed to the <laughs> that's a Chris. Well, I, I guess I guess one way you could think of it is uh, you could you have a character whose name is Spider Man, mm -hmm. but then you could have a character who is a Spider Man. Spider Man, yeah. yes. Oh, that's yeah. okay. There you go. <laughs> Um, let's, uh, let's jump back into some of these questions. Uh, angry Bob. Oh, Bob. Uh, would it be possible? Why are you angry, why are, Bob? Why, and there's 13 of you. Angry Bob 13. Would it be possible for an artificer to put the enhanced weapon infusion on a wand to get bonuses to their spells and cantrips? That would not work. Uh, the, that enhancement is meant for weapons and a wand does not uh, count as such. Uh, don't worry wand users though, as I was analyzing the class, uh, I realized oh, we could use an infusion that helps wands, <laughs> so uh, stay tuned. <laughs> uh, speaking of wands, Otto Weird uh, also asked, does the wand contain a single use of a cantrip or infinite uses of a cantrip? Ah, so the artillerist wand, mm -hmm. ha if it, that wand is able to have uh, different cantrips in it. Uh, once a cantrip is in that wand, uh, you can just keep casting it and casting it and casting it and casting it. It is not one use. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, some other questions that have come in uh, really quick. I did want to, to make a quick mention. Uh, we've been running a, a one of two raffles during this stream. Uh, giving away a DD and d shirt and uh, some, some nice minis from WizKids. So we'll be doing two of those. Again, thank you to our moderators for, uh, for running those as we've been going along. I saw a question come in from El Warius as well. Uh, will you both be at d and Live? And can we say hi? <laughs> we will both be there and please yeah. do say hi. I am, I, so that was the, uh, the nightmare of going on a trip while we were making the d, &D Live announcements was most of my trip was spent in a hotel room <laughs> just frantically <laughs> updating the web pages and adding groups and fielding this and that. But I will say I am very glad not to be sitting on the announcement anymore. It's always good just to get it out into, yeah. into the world. So. But that, so for those of you who don't know, that is sort of Bart's life because that last year's D&D <laughs> &D Live event, while, me, while, while many people were uh, DMing those fabulous games on camera, Bart was working behind the <laughs> scenes at his laptop making sure the whole show didn't go up in flames. <laughs> I'll, be doing much, I'll be doing much the same this year. Yeah. And yes, uh, we have announced Jeremy will be in attendance uh, as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've announced in what uh, specific capacity. Then uh, I won't say what it is I'm doing there. But, I was ab I'm glad you mentioned that because I was about to talk about <laughs> what I'll be doing there. Uh, but yes, May 17th through 19th will be in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, if, if you happen to be in attendance last year, we'll be at the same line, 204 Studios, uh, down a little bit south of the, the Hollywood area. Uh, we do have three-day, a, a limited number of three-day badges are uh, still available, but they are going pretty fast. So if you're interested, 
Uh, don't, don't wait on those. Uh, we will both be there. You will be able to say hi to Jeremy. I will probably be sequestered again in uh, a room with a, a strong internet connection. Which means if you do <laughs> see Bart, <laughs> no, it is a rare opportunity yes. and you should all mob him. It's a, it's a Pokemon Go, yes. one of those rare. Yeah, uh, we should actually have a bell re ring <laughs> when you're, like there's a Bart sighting. Bart, uh, where where yeah. you have you have made it out from backstage, <laughs> quick! Everyone, say hi to Bart. Just to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it's it's been great fun. It's a lot of work, but great fun to to be able to uh, announce big projects that are in the works. To be able to talk to to streamers and influencers, and of course players in the community as well, uh, and have a chance for them to meet more. I think of the D and D team uh, than other conventions where. You know, a, a smaller but number of us are able to attend. This one is a larger number of us are able to uh, to get down there. Uh, Shelley will be down there for a couple nights as well. So good, good. Uh, we were we were debating lengthening the trip to get over to Disneyland. Oh, but I think we're gonna we're gonna hold off on that. Oh, you should do it. Star Wars won't be quite open yet. Well, that that means this is the time to go because you won't you won't get to see the new yeah. Star Wars land. That's true. But it also means the park will not be impossible to move around in because mm. once the new land opens up, yeah. I'm probably going <laughs> to wait a year at least before I go back uh, because I'm imagining it's going to be a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, but you know I love Disneyland. Yes. So if anyone says to me, oh, I'm thinking about going to Disneyland, my response is always, go, go. <laughs> Why aren't you there already? Well, the plan now is uh, Disney World in December. Uh, and okay. maybe Star Wars will be open at that point. I fully anticipate we'll never be able to get in or see any of it. <laughs> but we haven't gone to Disneyland or World with the kiddo yet. Oh, okay. And I want to get the, the time when the magic is still. And he's, he is now the right age. Five, five and a half. He's, yeah. he's old oh, enough to kind of remember it. and Yeah, that's a great around. age. Yeah. And not be in a stroller the whole time is mm -hmm. also part of it. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here, let me, uh, I'm going to ask a question that I have here and stall while I look for your live questions as you answer that. Uh, Mr. Hill asks, I love the mechanical incorporation of crafting in the class. My question is why bonuses to crafting are limited to only potions and wands when the class calls out other artisan tools as well? Mm. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we focused on the magic items, uh, partly because that's a big deal in the original Artificer in 3rd edition, being able to make these different types of magic items. But if in the playtest feedback people would love to see the Artificer having an advantage making other types of things, uh, we'll definitely listen to that feedback and could explore doing it uh, in a future version of the class. And just like last time, oh, yeah. we didn't have Pelham. <laughs> the lights just went out, other than the uh, the uh, stage lights. All right, so I'm, uh, I think, well, I was going to get up fine. and run it. Yeah, yeah as well. So we, we should light some candles. We run a classy operation here. <laughs> the lights go out. <laughs> There's no one on the controls, uh, but, uh, but yes. yes. Uh, I, I, I'm asking this question off topic because I, I, I did ask if you had Jolly Green Knight, if you did have an old question, go ahead and, and ask it. So here it is. And this, I, I don't know if this is sort of a wishing for more wishes or a, a, a more of a riddle of a question, but here goes. All right. Create Bonfire is a cantrip that requires concentration and targets a point on the ground within range that the caster is able to see. Uh huh. So here's, here's the trick, though. So in a situation where the only thing enabling vision is the light from a caster's dancing lights cantrip, which also requires concentration, what will happen if he goes to cast create bonfire? So you're, you're, you're concentrating to create a light source, and you need the light source to create another light source. Right. So. Uh, Keep in mind that the instant you start casting a concentration spell, mm. if you're already concentrating on another spell, that other spell instantly ends. Could the lights going off in the studio have been more appropriately timed to this question? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. It's like, it's like last year at d and in a castle when I uttered the words Count Strahd von Zarovich and a bat, I kid you not, <laughs> right. a bat flew into the room. 
Uh, <laughs> one of the joys of DMing in a castle. Uh, so, <laughs> and here the lights went off. Um, so yeah, the the light from Dancing Lights wouldn't be there uh, for you to target uh, because the moment you started the new concentration spell, yeah. your concentration on the other spell ended. Uh, this is going to this is going to illustrate my own ignorance, but I'm going to ask it now. Is there, or would you ever consider, a feat or a spell that would allow dual concentrations of spells? Whew. Too many. Is that it, the can of worms the so, size of an oil drum there? So in the Dungeon Master's Guide, we have a section on customizing the rules uh, in your home game, and we point out that. Most of the game uh, is their DMs to be your playground, mm -hmm. customized to your heart's content. But one of the things we say is as, as you fiddle, one of the few things in the game we do not recommend you fiddle with is the number of spells people can concentrate on. Ah, uh, 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 it specifically calls out. Yes. Don't, please don't turn off this now. <laughs> so. <laughs> that said, we, we have actually fiddled with that in a few of our very high-level monsters. Mm -hmm. um, but there, we've done it because, uh, particularly with a legendary creature, a legendary creature is essentially an entire encounter bundled up into one stat block. Mm -hmm. And so it is basically functioning as multiple creatures, which right. is why we allow ourselves to break that rule once in a great, 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 great while. I mean, you know, the game came out in 2014 and we've only done that in our own design a, a few times. Uh, on the player side though, we've even toyed, to be, to be totally frank, we've toyed around with some subclass that did it or, you know, it's some capstone ability, oh God. Uh, <laughs> Going back it, to Demigorgon, I can picture, well, I've got two brains, right, so I can concentrate right. on this and this. Yep. But again, that's, if we did it there, that's in a, a legendary creature. Right, yes. Uh, that is essentially functioning like a group of monsters. So it's that's a different situation. And it's also a creature that's likely to only be at your game table once. Mm. And it's in, it's in the DM's hands. Lifting that restriction on the player side is an entirely different situation. Because once it's lifted on the player side, and if they're able to do it over and over and over again, you suddenly open the game up to interactions that we did not design the game for. Mm. Uh, the game can handle those unexpected interactions in isolated cases, uh, but it could get pretty messy if those interactions are happening over and over and over again. Now, something I often bring up when I talk about messiness, uh, I should clarify. Because someone listening to me might think, oh, Jeremy's worried about the game balance. Yes, it is possible there could be some imbalance that arises. But when I talk about messy and messy in this case, I'm actually talking about play speed and the fun of the play. I am often far more concerned about how the game feels at the table and how smoothly it runs than I am about, oh, is this thing you know, off by uh, a number, mm -hmm. you know, off by a point or two. Right. Now, I want the numbers to all be right too. But what's most important to me, partly because you all in the massive D&D Next play test told us that this was of high value to you, and that is the game moving quickly mm. and smoothly. And we learned from the D&D Next play test to always prioritize uh, whenever possible, smoothness of play. Mm. And what we discovered is that allowing a bunch of complicated spell effects to pile up on top of each other is one of the surest ways to bog your game down. It might not break anything, but you could see a combat that might take you normally 30 minutes to play, to, play through suddenly take 90 minutes to play through uh, because of all the simultaneous spell effects going on. Now, if that is your game group's bliss mm -hmm. and your DM doesn't mind managing that, then go for it. Uh, but it's not the kind of thing we would want to unleash <laughs> on all DMs. That's why often you'll hear, not only myself, but other members of the design team, we'll talk about things that we're, where we'll say, actually, DM, go ahead and try it. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, that sounds fun, go for it. 
But then you'll notice we don't do those things in official products because when we publish something in an official product, that is a thing that is potentially going to appear at any or potentially all D&D tables. Right. And so we have to make sure it's going to be fun to as many people as possible and not disruptive. Right. And that's why occasionally we'll say, hey, at your individual table, or even maybe at my individual table, a particular tweak will be fine, but that's because you get to manage it. Mm. When it comes to something that's gonna be at any old table, uh, we have to rely on all of you wonderful DMs out there managing it, and we wanna make sure your job is as easy as we can make it. Uh, so, I, ho hopefully that, uh, that answered your, your uh, question, Green Knight. Uh, and your question. I did. I, yeah. like it. I like it when you work questions I, into, the, into the mix. I, my questions are always like, huh, what sort of shenanigans can I get up to with this? Because you're, <laughs> you're that guy. I am, I am <laughs> that guy. I was, <laughs> my players, my characters are always the ones that are opening the chests that they were specifically told not to. Yeah. I want to know what's in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, as I leveled up, I noticed uh, so much emphasis and ability thanks to certain feats on tool sets. Will there ever be a certain singular item reward result of having a proficiency combination? Uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, proficiency in glass blower. Uh, tinkler's tools, jeweler's, gemologist tools equals a kind of new magic amulet, or is that just the end of discussion? Uh, so I, I guess what's asking here is, is proficiency in tool combinations, proficiency in tools, can you ever combine those in ways to, to create new right. and, effects? And, and, and so this is a option. question about the artificer, it yes. sounds like. Um, so currently in the game, uh, we do not have any rule that sort of Voltrons together tool proficiencies to produce something else. Certainly something mm. uh, a DM could explore yeah. with an Artificer player at an individual table. I also recommend everyone take a look at the tool section of Xanathar's Guide to Everything where we give you all sorts of different ways mm -hmm. you could use tools uh, in your campaign. Uh, including, I think you could take a number of the ideas in Xanathar's Guide and kind of Voltron them together uh, to, uh, you know, take this tool, tool proficiency, marry it with this other one, yeah. and produce some interesting result. I, I, that sounds intriguing. I would be fascinated to see uh, to see how, how that might work. Yeah. Uh, hey, if that's something you're interested in uh, in proposing for a, for a Dragon Plus article, maybe mm. as, a, mm -hmm. as a rules option, yeah. uh, hit me up on, on Twitter, and uh, we'll see about getting, getting and, that in there. And if someone hasn't already posted an exploration like that on DMs Guild, mm. uh, anyone out there who's you're pondering What's something I could design for DM Guild? I recommend you uh, experiment with this. Uh, Voltroning tool proficiencies. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with the artificer being introduced, would you ever consider including tools as magic items? So there are a few wondrous items in the game already that are tool-ish. Um, but yeah, the, we could certainly look at in the future uh, doing some more tool type magic items. Okay. I mean, the beauty of our magic item uh, design is we can really make a magic item out of almost anything. Uh, I mean, we could have you know the magic plunger or you know the the magic oven. Uh, well, we had the Girl Scout cookie converter. <laughs> That's which, right. Which is going to be a very handy item. <laughs> The the, uh, the that, Thanos unsnapper. That I don't know. for everyone who doesn't remember, <laughs> that magic item will turn all cookies into the best Girl Scout cookie, Thin Mints. No, so you feed the Thin Mints in as the garbage fuel, <laughs> and the good the shortbreads come out. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm amused by this every time we bring it up. I have I ask continually, how come there's no chocolate chip just chocolate chip Girl Scout cookie. I, and I don't know if it's because, well, you can get a chocolate chip cookie anywhere. Right. So you, you can only get a Thin Mint once a year, which does make some sense to me. But I'd convert it into new cookie types, <laughs> like the, the artificer, like the tool proficiencies. <laughs> I'd Voltron that. Uh, Professor Nightshade asks, I am very happy to see the artificer is out now. Hopefully, I am too. Yes. <laughs> 
Uh, hopefully soon, we might now find out what is happening with the Mystic, or has it gone the way of the Revised Ranger? Uh, so uh, the Mystic has not been permanently shelved, but it is sort of hanging out, uh, waiting for us to have a good spot for it in our schedule. Uh, but we are we are definitely still interested in doing some explorations with the Mystic slash Scion. I, I say it that way because there's a good chance if it ever returns, it will get its old name back, mm. which is Scion mm. uh, or something like it. Uh, but given our new approach to Unearthed Arcana, uh, we, we just don't have as much time anymore for just for fun design. Mm. Uh, the things we're working on now are things that like, even if it's not in the coming year, it might be in a future year, right, like right. this thing, we, we can see a book where that's gonna end up. Um, but we definitely want to do more work uh, with the Mystic uh, slash Scion. Uh, I've got a, uh, a story-based question and a, a rules-based question. Which one would you like first? Uh, let's do story, since okay. we've done rules so far. Uh, let's see, where did it go? Uh, here we go. Uh, Cypher of Tear asks, because I, I like paladins and sort of their their uh, their moral code and how that plays into mm. campaigns mm -hmm. and stories and some of the complications that can result. If a paladin fails to fulfill their oath, oops, it keeps dropping on me here. If a paladin fails to fulfill their oath in say a few years, will it affect their abilities, or can their uh, deity abandon them for failing in their oath? So I, I guess what's the grace period in a paladin? you know, maintaining their particular code of, of moral conduct? So that, that is really a question for uh, the DM and the player. Uh, we are purposefully vague in the player's handbook about not only uh, paladin <laughs> oaths, but also cleric <coughs> domains. Uh, if a DM and a player like the idea of an oath's power or a domain's power coming directly from the god and the god maybe turning it off, uh, go for it. And I just recommend that if, if you do take that route, then make it relatively painless mm. for the character to switch to a different oath, or in the case of a cleric, to a different domain. Mm. Uh, it's very easy to explain if, let's say the paladin has, has broken the word of their oath, well, it, it could turn out that the paladin is still being true to the spirit of it, uh, or you could even have a paladin who's not even being true to the spirit of it, but then the paladin has the, an existential crisis when they realize their powers were not coming from a god at all. Mm. Uh, and they might be coming from the paladin's own convictions. Uh, and that, again, is something we've been purposefully vague about at different times so that you as players and you as DMs can flesh out the cosmic story for characters like clerics, mm -hmm. Paladins, but this would also include clerics like druids and rangers who get their magic from some external place. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in contrast to uh, wizards who basically think themselves into their magic. They've studied their way into it. Sorcerers who were born with it or were somehow shaped by it. And then warlocks, are, the warlocks occupy a sort of delicious gray area between those. I love where, warlocks. Yeah, where warlocks have some magic of their own, but then they also have the magic that they got from their patron. Mm. But warlocks are not required to even like their patron. <laughs> uh, war, warlocks basically, in some ways, can, can be thought of as very clever rules lawyers uh -huh. who you know, have made some deal and they got, some, they got something out of it. Yeah but they might just be working that deal to their own their own ends. I, I uh, picture them as sort of renaissance artisans where it's, here's a thing I want to make. I just, I have to have a patron yep, that will yep. fuel my, my, my yeah. vision here. And one, one example of this with warlocks, uh, and I believe uh, we might even have given this example in the player's handbook, is you could have a warlock uh, who has the fiend as your patron and you use that power to then fight the forces <laughs> of the abyss and of hell. Uh, and that you're basically just using the patron as a, as a battery to fuel uh, your righteous crusade. Uh, on the flip side, you could have a warlock who is, who is buddy-buddy uh, with their patron. Uh, 
Whereas again, when you when you talk about clerics mm -hmm. and paladins in particular, the assumption is generally that you know they're 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 close, they're tight with with the deity or the force or the philosophy that they serve. Uh, and then with with druids and rangers, it's a it's a bit it's a bit sort of more misty on how it works mm -hmm. because in some settings. Uh, Druids and rangers are tied to nature gods, right. and then in other settings, they're much more tied to just sort of nature as an abstract force. Mm. What if a warlock lost their patron, Deceive asks? Uh, that again is up to the DM. Uh, it, our assumption is basically when you make the deal with your patron, it's, it's like you were given the magic and you're good. Uh, it's up to the DM and the player whether you want an ongoing relationship with the patron to be the source of the magic or if basically you were given it all up front and then it just sort of, you unlock the power as you become more knowledgeable and, and you level up. Uh, that's a really a story detail mm. uh, that's up to you all. Uh, if you want the power of your warlock to be tied to an ongoing relationship and that relationship ends, just as with a cleric or a paladin, DMs, I would say, please make it relatively uh, uh, easy for the warlock to switch to another patron. Uh, and the reason why I say that is uh, you, unless the player is hungry for the extra adversity, most players are not going to want to have to sit through session after session where they don't have any subclass abilities. Mm. Um, but that said, some players love a challenge. And so if you have a player who's like, yeah, shut off my subclass, then do it. Uh, there, there, there are generally in our classes enough abilities in the base class that they'll still be able to contribute even if they are missing some of their juicy subclass abilities. And there's great story pot telling potential here where yeah. your, your deity or patron commands a quest out of you that mm -hmm. you have to fulfill to gain or regain your powers or maybe there's competing deities that want you on, on their team. And so right. they're going to loan you uh, some abilities or powers uh, along the way and sway you. Yeah. I was just chuckling, I was thinking of the dual concentration, like the paladin, you can't have a dual oath either. Right. So if you don't fulfill one, you know, you could fall back on, on the other oath and, yeah. and then be, uh, <laughs> still, be, still I, be a fully functional paladin. I've, I've mentioned before either on, on our show or with Greg Tito <coughs> on Sage Advice that in my home game, uh, I allowed the paladin in my home game to change his oath. Uh, right. he, he changed from uh, the oath of devotion to the oath of vengeance. Mm. Uh, and that was a story choice. And I allowed it to happen purely in a story context mm. where the paladin spent a night in prayerful vigil. And by the next morning, uh, his subclass was, was the other one. Gandalf, he switched from uh, Gandalf the Grey to Gandalf the White. That's so, right. Yeah, there's a right. story. There's transitions in characters in, in many storytelling uh, platforms and vehicles. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, so before we switch over here to Heroes of the Veil, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we were covering all of the, uh, the things, the news that have been going on in, in recent days. Again, I just wanted to reiterate the next issue of Dragon Plus, issue 25, will be releasing ASAP uh, as soon as uh, end of this week for sure, I would like to say. D&D uh, &D Live is going to be taking place May 17th through the 19th. You can, of course, uh, follow along on this D&D Twitch channel for all of the activities uh, taking place. Uh, we'll also be expanding our coverage into some sub-channels as well because we've got a lot of, of uh, streaming content and we want to make sure uh, that you're able to view uh, as much of it as, as possible. Uh, I've, covered, uh, I've covered the Avengers coming out now. I was going to make a crack about everyone in the office being out ill in, in recent days. So yes, I, I did <laughs> it is true. Th thank you for the flexibility of your schedule. Uh, I know we've been switching things around, but uh, we're, we're looking to make sure that we've got an every other week cadence. So uh, we'll, we'll be doing this on a, on a regular basis now that we're on uh, out of a little bit of an uh, illness and vacation uh, uh, cycle. So uh, thank you for, for joining us as always. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's uh, one more question. That I think we have time for one. Yes. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, uh, we've got that rules question. 
Uh, Dragonborn breath weapons. Why the um, decision to make them standard actions in this edition as, as opposed to um, previous editions where they were sort of uh, uh, a bonus action? Oh, a minor action. A minor fourth, action. Yeah, in fourth yes. edition. Uh, especially in our initial player's handbook design, uh, we defaulted to making things actions. Mm -hmm. um, we, we honestly, when we were making the player's handbook, were very hesitant to make too many things bonus actions mm -hmm. because we so wanted the game to move quickly. Kind of going back to your, your previous yep. uh, point. And, and we wanted a typical round in combat in particular uh, for a typical turn mm -hmm. uh, in that round to just be your move and your action, and that's it. We didn't want every character's turn to be move, bonus action, and action. And that's why most things you'll see in the player's handbook are actions. There are, there are actually not that many things uh, given, given if you like count it up, number of spells, number of class features, number of feats, there are not, relatively speaking, a whole lot of bonus actions. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that, again, is to keep things moving uh, and to make, you know, when you decide to do something, uh, you do it and yeah. your turn's over. <laughs> uh, and because it's what we wanted is that you didn't need to load everything into one turn because your next turn is going to come back around fast enough right. that you can do that fun thing in your next turn. It's you your don't, turn. You, yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't have to load <coughs> every cool thing into every turn. Uh, you, you're going to get another one, and it's coming really <laughs> quick, uh, unless you have a, an unusually large group. Yeah. All right, uh, so, so there you go. Uh, all right, so uh, again, uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in for an hour of your afternoon. It's greatly appreciated. We hope we we're able to answer some of your questions. Uh, as always, we'll be going through the chat logs, compiling the questions we didn't get a chance to ask, uh, making an archive of those. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll answer, we'll definitively answer a few more of those uh, for next time. So. Uh, from the D&D team, thank you for tuning in again, and we'll see you uh, next week. And, and Jeremy, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Bye, everyone. Now comes the fun part where I will remotely end the stream. <laughs> and, and speaking of illness, I could feel the bronchitis coming back in. Uh -oh. So it's, it's an apropos time to hit this button and see what happens. Boop. Boop.